Iowa for 30 years or more. Yeah. Yes, there's so much. Oh, Frank, too, my good friend. They're all my good friends. <laughs> So welcome. Along. I know some of you had to get up quite early and drove all the way from Davenport, I believe, your sisters, and uh, I hope the directions help somehow. Uh, I'm still lost after having been here for 30 years. I forget whether second, third, or fourth floor, and I just start with one, two, three, four, five, and eventually I can find it. This morning I was driving down a one-way street because Dr. Peter Creep was with me. <laughs> so I almost ran into one of our members here, and so I owe her an apology. <laughs> apology. So Monica, you are here today because I would make a quick uh, uh, turn the other way. But I was telling Dr. Creep that one day I was so used to uh, uh, kind of, you know, before 12 for a lunch appointment, coming down, walking down on Jefferson Street, which is one way going the other way. But if you walk on the sidewalk, that's okay. But this particular day I was driving. <laughs> so I was going down and I keep saying to myself, how come everybody's going the wrong way today? <laughs> yeah. But uh, well, most of you have heard Dr. Grift uh, last night who have not met him. Okay, there are quite a few and I want to welcome you. Uh, again, to the University of Iowa, to Iowa City, and there will be plenty of time for you to interact with him. Our plans are then to begin uh, maybe with probably a half an hour to 40 minutes of presentation, and then there will be discussion. Then we'll break for coffee uh, and donuts. <coughs> they will replenish orange juice too. And then we'll come back again for another half an hour to 40 minutes, and then more interaction, discussion, and then we plan to uh, end before noon or by noon. And there are books out there, so uh, feel free to uh, uh, buy them. And we have this special agreement with Dr. Peter Crift. Uh, he's willing to autograph as many books as you buy without extra charge. So that should be an incentive. And Inga, I'm sure, does not want to drag those books back to Master Seed. So, uh, yes. So maybe this could be a record, the first time we sell all the books. <laughs> Great. And of course, I want to thank Anga and everyone for helping too to make this a possibility. We uh, invited Dr. Cook to come two years ago, and, uh, and at first we were hoping that he would be here last year, and because of family emergency and other responsibilities that uh, we had to delay this for one more year. But uh, you know, good things, the longer you wait, the better. So here we are, we have Dr. Peter Crypt here, and, uh, and he and I uh, have one thing in common, I think. He plays table tennis, and I do a little bit too, so we're hoping that maybe after the workshop that maybe he and I could <laughs> play table, table tennis. He does a lot of things. He, last night he made a confession saying, no, he didn't write 38 books, only 35. Oh. And, uh, but he plans to write at least another one every year for the next few years. So it may be, what, 60, 70, or 80. Who knows, right? So we're so grateful that uh, he is here with us. I, I value him so much. And, and uh, I remember when I was in the varsity staff in the late 60s, the first book that uh, uh, I was introduced to Dr. Kirk was the book uh, Between Heaven and Hell that describes uh, three important people who died the same day within hours of one another. And John Kennedy, of course, the name you're familiar with, but C.S. Lewis, an Anglican, died also on that same day, and so was the humanist uh, Aldous Huxley. And, and the book Between Heaven and Hell was the one that I uh, was intrigued and, and uh, to think what he's really a person of great imagination and no doubt coming to Iowa will inspire him to write many more books. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you so much. Perhaps we could, we could open it with a short prayer. Okay. Dear God, we thank you so much for bringing Dr. Peter Crift to us. Thank you for blessing him with a good mind and for his unselfishness to share all that he knows and his gifts with us. And indeed, we are very fortunate.
to have him in our midst. And we thank you too for all those who have come today, some from perhaps even further than Davenport, and for the efforts that we have made, they have made to be with us today. We ask for your blessing and use Dr. Kriv to inspire us, to stimulate us, to challenge us, to stretch us, so that we may grow to be more like Jesus Christ, so that our minds may be like his, and that our hearts will care for people and for one another the way he does, perhaps in a small way. Bless us then today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome with me, Dr. Peter. Thank you all for coming, and thank you all for your hospitality, <coughs> Dr. Chen. Actually, you all came from a distance greater than Davenport. You came from nothing. <laughs> God brought you from nothing to here, and he brought himself from everything to here, just so that he could meet you at this moment. That's true every moment in your life. That, that's an amazing effort. Uh, if I write a book inspired by my trip to Iowa, what would it be? My wife already says my books are too corny. <laughs> <laughs> now I know you're gracious after I insult you, you laugh. <laughs> I'd like to do two sessions this morning. The first one will be fairly short and we'll make just one point, and then we'll have some discussion about it, and then we'll break uh, a little before halfway through the morning. And then the second session, we'll make a number of points and take a somewhat longer time, and probably have a somewhat longer discussion. But before we begin, I'd like to do something. I'd rather I'd like you to do something for me. Uh, this satisfies my curiosity, as well as being a kind of mirror or a technique for you to see something about uh, where you're coming from. This is a questionnaire, which I'm going to pass out, and I'd like you each to answer it uh, in pen or pencil on this paper, not just in your mind, because uh, you can change things in your mind, but you can't change things that are on a piece of paper. Uh, if, if I pretend that that's a mirror, I can imagine that I look young and handsome, but if I look in the real mirror, I, I, it's non-negotiable. So, so I'm going to ask you simply to answer these 15 questions. Uh, there are a strange variety of questions. Uh, some personal questions, some philosophical questions, and some theological questions. Uh, and uh, the directions are simply to be honest and short. Answer them as shortly as possible. I have almost no space in which you can answer the questions. That's deliberate. I don't want you to write an essay. I don't have the time. And I don't like much reading them, unless they're absolutely brilliant. Uh, so give yourself 10 seconds per answer. And the other thing is to be honest and spontaneous and immediate. Like in psychoanalysis, you make Freudian slips, uh, like word association because that reveals something to you that wouldn't be revealed if you took the time to think very carefully and sort it out, and then those funny answers would come. <laughs> so write your answers down uh, honestly and quickly, and there's no need to rush, and this is anonymous, and you're able to get hand them in, but I'm going to talk about them uh, in a moment.
we've all got answers down there. Then, let's dialogue. Not with each other, not even with me, but with God. Let's compare your answers with God's answers. What, did I give God this questionnaire? <laughs> no, but he gave his answers to it. Jot down next to each answer. You probably wrote your answer on the right-hand side, so jot down on the left-hand side of each number. The address of God's answer. The verse in the New Testament that tells us God's answer to each of these questions. So that we can put the two side by side and compare them and see concretely what still needs to be done to bring ourselves into more perfect alignment with God. That's a meaning of life, after all. And once you've done that, take it home and think about it and pray about it and think about why there is a difference, if any, between your answers and God's answers. Let's start with number one, the personal questions. Who do you think is the greatest living person in the world today? Did you mention Jesus Christ? If not, you better read Matthew 28, verse 20. Lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Or Luke 24, verse 5. The angel saying to the women at the empty tomb, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? I assume you are here because you are Christians, but uh, if you didn't answer Jesus Christ to question number one, then you better listen to the angel. Suppose I had given you two columns, uh, great dead people and great living people. Would you have put them in the dead column? Or would you maybe have put them in neither column because he's not great or because he's not a person? <laughs> Number two, each of you will have perhaps a different name here, but have you forgotten Philippians 4, verse 19? God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. He doesn't say uh, Christ is for our religious needs and others are for our secular needs. There is no distinction between the secular and the sacred in the Bible. There is a distinction between the holy and the unholy, but that's not the same thing. Christianity eliminates certain things that the pagan worldview had. It doesn't just add certain things. It does that too, but it eliminates certain things. For instance, the, uh, the doctrine of the philosophers that things happen by fate or chance. There is no such thing as chance for a Christian the God whose universe is totally subject to his knowledge and will, does not contain a single hair that falls from anybody's head. So here's another category that does not exist in Christianity, the secular. It doesn't exist, there's nothing secular, everything's sacred. Every splinter of wood in that Nazareth carpenter shop was sacred, and it should be in ours too. This does not exclude human means and second causes and God raises up people to do his work for him and it's right to name uh, merely human beings in two, but they are the agents, uh, the instruments of Christ. Three, how can you who are evil and unrighteous become good and righteous? How do you become a saint? Nice simple question. In 25 words or less? No, 24 of those words are superfluous. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. Christ is labeled our righteousness and our sanctification. Christ Jesus, whom God made to be our wisdom and our righteousness and our sanctification. Notice the language there. It doesn't even say that uh, he gives us uh, wisdom and righteousness and sanctification. It says he is our righteousness. Righteousness, sanctification, holiness, saintliness is not something, but someone.
Number four, what would you tell a friend who is dying? The most important thing you can do on a nearly human level to a friend who is dying is simply speak the word of your own presence. Simply be there. What you say is unimportant. And the one thing that you can do that is even more important than that is to present Christ in words if necessary. John 11, verse 25 would be my answer to question four, where Jesus is eliciting faith from Martha before he resurrects Lazarus. And before the external miracle of the resurrection of a man dead and rotting for three days happens, the much greater internal miracle of the resurrection of faith in Martha's soul happens. Because she already has a kind of faith. Oh Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And he replies, your brother will rise again. And Martha says, oh, I know he'll rise in the resurrection of the last day. Something.